Hi everyone, thanks for coming and welcome to Mars. Uh, in case you didn't know, you were one of the first humans ever to experience Martian light. But I'll let these guys talk more about that. I want to introduce our speakers today. We have Spencer Finch, whose installation we're in, whose Martian sunrise we're in front of. And in conversation with him is Richard Parry, a curator from the planet of Blackpool, who's come all the way here to talk to Spencer and has a special interest in works of art uh, dealing with light, an artist dealing with light. Um, there'll be time for questions at the end. I want to keep it to an hour, but um, yeah, take it away, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Ossian. Um, so, hello, Spencer. Hello, <laughs> Morning. Richard. Morning, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. It's great to see. Uh, this turnout, first of all, um, for, this, for this show. And as a starting point, it's hard to maybe not start, or it, it's hard to avoid starting with the, uh, with the work behind us uh, from the planet Mars. So, so perhaps, Spencer, you could, you could begin by, by just saying a few words about, about this work. And I, I think the, the genesis of it came from this desire to uh, make, I mean, it's almost like making a picture of something no one's ever seen. So this idea, or creating a, a, an experience or a situation which no human has ever experienced. And so I, um, I, I was thinking about light, light that no one has experienced. I'm interested in, in light in other places and in other times, and light as a sort of different convention for making a, a landscape, really. Um, so I thought, oh, well, Mars uh, is a place where no human has been, but where, uh, where spacecrafts have, have landed. And so I wondered whether there was the data available to, um, to recreate the light conditions. And there, in fact, was tons of data uh, from three missions mm -hmm. to Mars uh, that NASA made that had lots of um, uh, spectrographic information on the, uh, the color of the light there. So I had a, a whole trove of data to work from, and then it's just a matter of uh, shifting the light of these daylight fluorescents to, to the light of Mars, which is generally described as uh, pinkish, brownish, yellowish. Um, <laughs> and you can see the difference in the, the Martian light to the uh, earthly light uh, by looking through that, that door and you see the, the blue light of Earth coming down through the skylights. It really is amazing actually how that door is kind of a portal <laughs> between <laughs> the, the two planets in this extraordinary way. And it's something I guess I'd be, was, was really thinking about going through the show was uh, your, your efforts to kind of place yourself as a viewer in, into somebody else, whether that's a bee or, or somebody, an astronaut on the planet, um, that, that shifting of perspective or into another viewer, even in another animal, seems to be something that, 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 that kind of, that comes up. And also with the, with the piece through, uh, through the kind of far left, mm -hmm. um, where you have constructed uh, maybe, maybe say a little bit about that because that's also about the conditions of, um, of viewing as mm -hmm. well, perhaps as well. Well, I guess I, I really like the, the sort of subjectivity of, of vision and the subjectivity of experience. And I think it's yes. so sort of wonderful and beautiful that we all see different things that, and, and also that it's in, in, in some, on, on some level, almost a structural level, in opposition mm. to some sort of objectivity or some sort of to to total truth. Mm. And so um, I, I think my own sort of repeated attempts to use my own perception to, uh, to observe and then represent something, it, it's, it seems sort of part and parcel of also trying to then get out of myself and trying yeah. to imagine what some other subjective being uh, would see or and also just to think uh, to, to, to sort of cr 
think about how sort of wide, you know, our, our sort of perceptual apparatus is so narrow, the sort of wavelengths that we take into our consciousness are quite tiny. Whereas a bee, for example, can see colors that we can't see <clears throat> as it goes further down the visible spectrum. And, and that idea that there's all this stuff happening in the world that we're, that, that we're just not aware of is fascinating to me. Yeah, in, in our world and also in the kind of in the solar system, I was on a panel earlier in the week talking about light in lots of different ways, and there was a, there was a scientist talking about, um, about the sun, actually, uh -huh. uh, in particular. And, uh, and, and one of the things she said, which I just sort of blew me away as a fact, <laughs> is that the particles in the sun take 170,000 years to get from you know, the center of the sun to the, to the surface of the sun. Really? Uh, yeah, and then eight minutes to get from there to, to uh -huh. Earth, which is quite fascinating. All the kind of mechanisms that they're going on in there, but, uh, uh -huh. which was a kind of, struck me as a, uh, yeah, as, as a fact we're bringing up. Um, but so, so we're, on, we're on Mars here as a Martian. Uh -huh. um, well, <laughs> looking at this, uh, could you say, because you mentioned there about horizons, uh, and that was one thing that I was thinking about as I came into this piece, the, 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 the arrangement of the fluorescent tubes, and that, that there is a kind of horizon line, perhaps with the bottom. Was that in your thinking? Or is yeah, it... yeah, I mean, in, in a way, it's an incredibly conventional picture of a sunrise, which I think, <laughs> you know, every, every like, person who makes a picture, it's probably, you know, mm. certainly top 10 in subject matter. So it is, and, you know, I, I, I like, uh, like pretty much everyone has, feels like, you know, I feel like I have a few sunrise uh, pictures in me. So it is, it is that I wanted, I mean, it's a little bit, I think, you know, silly, this idea of a sunrise on Mars, mm -hmm. but also it, um, <clears throat> I think, ties into my uh, interest in um, 19th century painting and, yeah. and light at different times of day and, and especially Monet's serial work of, of light at different, at different times. Yeah, I was also thinking about, because um, there was a show at Turner Contemporary in Margate a few years ago, and, um, and obviously they, they, a lot of the shows have, a, have an echo with, with, with Turner, and you'd selected a picture that I think was on your studio wall uh -huh. for many years yeah. uh, of Turner's. Could you say a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, that yeah. actually is, I mean, it, my... I mean, I, I, I love Turner so much, but yeah. uh, there's a, a small watercolor that is of a, uh, of a burning ship off the coast, and mm. it was possibly near Margate, and this sort of fire and smoke, and, mm. but at the same time as being fire and smoke, it's, uh, it's watercolor you know, flowing across, and that, I think what I love about that is the sort of materi material sort of paradox, or the, the sort of, the, that sort of weird contrast between the material that is used to represent something. And, yeah. uh, and so there, there's water that is used to represent uh, smoke and, and, and fire, and also you know, just this incredible gift that uh, Turner had for being able to move uh, that watercolor around on the paper very quickly and have it be right at the edge between abstraction and representation. Mm -hmm. And that, that edge is something I'm really interested in, and it's, it's also something that's I think apparent here uh, at yeah. that point. No, definitely. I mean that, uh, and you know, one of the one of the other kind of motifs or, or, or themes, I guess, that that comes up in the show again and again, which really touches on that, and also reminded me of of, of, of Turner's work as well. It, the fog. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is uh, um, this this thing that is both present and absent that is immaterial and material at the same time. Can, mm. can you say a little bit about your interest in fog and where those works have come from? Yeah, I mean, it's just such an incredible, uh, I mean, material effect, yeah. Yeah, weather condition, whatever it is, because it, it is like a screen. It is, you know, you can kind of project whatever you want onto it. it, it, it it sort of hides and reveals, and um, and you know it, it interacts with the landscape in a very interesting way in that it can sort of uh, explain depth. You know, mm. often you know the landscape can appear quite flat, but as fog is moving through it, you can get a sense of the depth of the landscape, what's closer, what's further away. Mm. Um, and but I think it's uh, you know I, I guess that whole 
the, the whole sort of idea of a, of a monochrome, of a blank image, is something that I was sort of trained on and find so compelling and, and some sort of, you know, sort of negative theology of, you know, only the hand that erases writes the true thing. So I find that compelling. Of course, you can only make so many blank canvases. It's not so interesting to me. But that sort of edge where, where erasure happens, where disappearance happens, mm -hmm. where absence happens is, is a really sort of fascinating threshold for me. And, and it also comes down, I mean, it's a much more sort of, those drawings there have a much more uh, practical origin in that I was looking at um, uh, lithographs of, uh, of Whistler, of, of Fogg, that he, he had done. And, um, and he also did paintings, of course. And I thought, you know, how much I would, I sort of covet them. And so I thought, oh, well, I can, I could do my own. So it's a little bit of, <laughs> it's a little bit of making my own whistler in some way. That's, that's really nice. <laughs> and, and, and say a bit about the process of making those, those, those as well. Yeah, um, so that, so they're made, um, so I mask off an area <clears throat> and, and the, the form kind of happened accidentally with the, with the image sort of centered in the paper and, and, kind of has, a, I think, a reference to, to printmaking in some way, yeah. you know, the way the plate hits the center. Um, and there's uh, a ground of white pastel that's rubbed in, and then I work from photographs and notes, and mm -hmm. then to, to get the, there's a lot of color in them, and so I grind up um, uh, pastel and different grays and different colors and, and use it mostly with just small little bits of, of pastel on my fingers and mask off per, parts of it and sort of work work into it and um, can only, I mean, the, the paper is, um, can only take so much, so at some yeah. point it sort of reaches a, a point where the, it starts flocking as too much and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's gone. So mm. it's also a matter of uh, sort of, it has to happen pretty, pretty quickly, otherwise it, it starts, the, the image destroys itself in some yeah. way. So, and which I like that there's, you know, you can only um, mess with it for so long. There's a limit to the playing around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's good. And one of the things, I mean, you mentioned Whistler there. We've mentioned Turner as well. Um, you know, Emily Dickinson comes up. There's a, uh, there's a sort of strain of, of um, references to a certain kind of period. Mm -hmm. it, that's interesting. Is there, a, is there a reason for being drawn, I guess, to that time? Or is that something you've... <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, there is a real. I mean, I, I mean, the nineteenth century is, mm. you know, interesting in a lot of ways. I think one one thing that's interesting to me is that it was a time when people weren't specialists. <clears throat> right. When people could have a broad range of knowledge. When people could be scientists or and yeah. artists at the same time. They could be doing. There there weren't these these clear lines of demarcation between yeah. uh, between occupations or professions or even interests and. Uh, someone could be, you know, an alchemist and a and a painter at at the same time, and, and I think that's um, that that's uh, really um, appealing. I mean, I think there's also, you know, this sort of moment of um, this this sort of triumph of the scientific method, which is something that's so interesting to me, both as a sort of scientific method and mm -hmm. as a sort of artistic practice. This idea of of experimenting and trying and trying and trying, and that and that you sort of approach the truth somehow by through multiplicity and 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 re repeating and and also failing. Yeah. So I, I, I think that, that that's really interesting because you know we were, we were talking a little bit earlier as well about um, just just you and me in in the in the space there about the um, the, uh, the kind of contraption or the the room that you'd set up in your studio. And it seems to me so much of your work goes back to your studio, but here you've kind of set up a almost like a science experiment yeah. of of uh, you grappling with perception and uh, uh, and light um, mm. and what that means for you as an artist, but kind of almost adopting the sort of scientist working alone or something. But yeah. so there, you you set up a an environment for keeping light stable where you were. Uh, mixing colors and painting, mm -hmm. but but that the light in your studio was changing as the day moved moved along, and, yeah. and that's uh, yeah. And I had an aperture that I was looking through to look at the still lives, and so I was would mix paint to match the color of the objects as they changed in different yeah. light conditions. And so, if you if you're mixing uh, 
paint in the light condition in which you, uh, in which you are observing the object. So the object changes, the paint changes, so they change together, and so there is no, there's no space between the representation and, the, and what you're looking at uh, in, in, the, uh, in the final uh, presentation. So there's no, there's no gap between, uh, there's, uh, between what you see and what you represent. So it's almost like uh, if you were going to mix a color in this space, and then mix the same color in the earthly space, you would get a different color. And that's totally interesting to me. And so the idea is, well, the still life looks like you always think that it's, you know, that a, uh, an orange in, uh, it, at noon is the same color as an orange at dusk, but it's, in fact, it's, it's not. And um, I, I don't know why I find that so interesting. And I, and, I, and I don't necessarily expect other people to find it interesting, but somehow it's sort of, it's, yeah. it's compelling to me. And it is, I mean, I guess it is scientific in a, in, in a way because I, I, I am, I, yeah, I really try to get the color as close as possible. I'm working very quickly, but I'm really trying to match the color as close, close as possible. And it's something that over the years, I feel like I've gotten pretty good at is mixing and matching quickly. Yeah, and I, th I mean, I think that, you know, obviously you mentioned about landscapes and you mentioned about uh, points of the day. I mean, it, it's funny, in Blackpool, you know, we have, we're on the West Coast and it, one of the most stunning things is in the evening when the sun sets behind the sea and you do just get these incredible vistas. And that was one of the things I was, I mean, there's many things that remind me of, of, of Black, Blackpool or, or kind of make me think about aspects of, of Blackpool, but, but that sort of horizon and the, and the, and the sun, um, yeah, I, I'm not surprised that this is a, you know, that, that this is a kind of point of interest. I think that there's a sort of, um, yeah, there are certain things, I, I guess, that as humans we're drawn to. Mm. Uh, mm. And I think, so, you know, sunsets in a way is, 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 is one of those. And um, my first encounter with your work was at the Haywood for the exhibition New Decor, uh, which I was organising, and, uh, and you showed a piece there which was, um, if you encountered it, it looked like the stars of a night sky. This was um, uh, back in 2010, I think, um, and it was installed above the, um, the kind of ramp. I, it, people are familiar with the Haywood in, on, the, on the ground floor. Uh, and, and it was these sort of great big bulbs, light bulbs, that, that looked like a, a night sky. And in a sense, it was a representation of the night sky above Arizona. Yeah. That's, that's right. Uh, but actually, what you discovered was that this representation of an apparent kind of constellation was the representation of the molecules of the paint, because you'd painted the scene. Yeah, I and matched then... the color of the black of the sky. And, uh, and so it was the molecular uh, structure of that of the three or four pigments in, the, in yeah. that paint. Yeah. And I think this kind of almost like negation of expectation or upturning of what you think you're seeing mm -hmm. is also where the sort of, the scientist becomes the poet or, you know, that, uh -huh. that is a really nice moment, I think, in your, in your work. One of the things that's interesting about, about this is, it, um, obviously, you've got the kind of echoes with, with, with Dan Flavin and the fluorescence. Can you say a little bit about, I mean, I'm very drawn to the, um, the use of the, of the films uh -huh. in that way. Can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, you know, really any light, because our eyes are only sensitive to RGB, any light can be created by combining red, green, and blue. So yeah. because that's all, that's all our, 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 our retinas are sensitive to. So in fact, this... I mean, the, the, this choice of colors is, is a sort of indulgence on my part. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so, um, it's a beautiful indulgence. <laughs> so it is, because uh, it really is just about the light. And if, yeah. I, if I were more of a purist, it would be, you know, you, you would be forbidden from, of, from looking at this. You would have to just look at the light in the room. But I, I'm interested in also uh, sort of having a slight pictorial element. And I don't know exactly why. And, and, and um, and so in order to match the readings that were taken mm -hmm. from the Pathfinder mission, I used a colorimeter on a, and, and had different uh, 
filters on a lamp and would change them, change the size of them, change the percentage of them, mix them around until I got the same match. And so it was a, a precise match for the, for the reading of the sunrise on Mars. And then, um, and then really tried to think about colors that suggested this idea of the uh, pinkish, uh, brownish, uh, yellowish light mm -hmm. of, of Mars. So, yeah. so I was able to use, use that. And it, in some cases, it got a little, if it, it went too pink, then there's a blue on there which sort of pulls it back closer. So, so it, is, it is, in a way, you know, the sort of decorative uh, yeah. even aspect that refers to the, this, sort of, this sort of spectacle, I guess, mm. of a sunrise. It's interesting. I mean, I was thinking about, um, I'm going to get, I'm gonna get the scientific name for this wrong, forgive me, but, but when, when you kind of separate colors, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a particular experiment where um, you can kind of separate out a kind of uh, an element into different sort of into the different of, wavelengths. Exactly. That, yeah, 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 so yeah. Newton's experimentum crucis. I'm not surprised. But I don't know what it's called exactly. But, yeah. <laughs> Great. And I, so I was thinking about that as well. Um, also, I may be completely... Yeah, because this is the opposite of that in a way, right. because all of these colors combine to form one color, which is mm. what we see here, yeah. the sort of general color. So, yeah. so in a sense, it is the sort of opposite of a prism in that it, it takes the... These are all colors at different wavelengths, those wavelengths to combine in a certain percentage to create a certain overall light. And so it, it is, in fact, the opposite of what happens with a prism. But I do also like the, the way you were saying that actually you could almost... You'd quite like to blank this off. So that, so that actually, because the work is so much about the room and the space that we're in here, as well as as well as the, you know, uh, as well as the, the light fittings yeah. uh, themselves over here, and uh, you know, and as you say, the kind of glow that it then emanates. Because you, as you come down, you don't really see the lights. You just see yeah. this sort of strange glow yeah. coming out. Yeah, um, but I mean, at the same time, I mean, I guess I'm of two minds about that right. because there is, there is that tradition in like American, you know, light and space art, mm. which, I, which I mostly detest and I feel that I'm really <laughs> different. Uh, you know, I think like for, for Terrell example, yeah. Terrell's work, for example, when you see one of those, you know, the, the, uh, the sort of deep colored um, light, lit uh, uh, rectangles, and then you, you know, it's sort of a smoke and mirrors thing. And, mm. um, and then you sort of, you realize that there, there's a, a void and then you look in and then you see that you can see the mechanism that makes it. And then, it, and so for me, that's a sort of, it becomes a sort of gestalt experience yeah. of art. And so you don't, you, you, it doesn't have repeatability. It's very hard and, and it, it, uh, it's something that I feel is, um, it's like a trick and it's a, mm. a gimmick. And so I, I'm, I, I much prefer to actually have the, um, the, the sort of source, the, the sort of uh, technology, the material, whatever, yeah. out there and, and be part of the piece and be so, sort of totally yeah. present. The apparatus on, 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 on full view. And, um, and I, I think, mean, it's a kind of ethic, I guess, yeah. of, of art making, which, is, which varies for different people, of course. And a lot of, obviously, the materials that you use are very simple, everyday kind of objects, of yeah. course, you know, the present light bulb as well, yeah. but I was thinking about the, we mentioned Emily Dickinson earlier, um, and you know, this is obviously somebody that, that, that crops up again and again, and one piece that is extraordinary is this kind of hanging cloud piece that you did, which was a, which was, um, uh, a sort of blue material in mm -hmm. the room, just, just elegantly hanging. Uh, and, and that was, uh, can you explain a little bit about that? Yeah, it, well, it, it, um, I really had long wanted to do a piece uh, about the feeling of a passing cloud. Mm. And it's not, yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't, you know, don't find it so <laughs> interesting, needless to say. But for me, it's always been so moving, whether you're inside or outside. And there's this moment when, the, when, a, when a cloud comes yeah. and, the, and the intensity and the color of the light changes. It seems to happen more in summer because you have these big cumulus clouds yeah. floating by. And it's, it's it's a deeply sort of, uh, I don't know, it's a very moving experience for me, and all, still, and since I was a child. So I wanted to do a piece about that idea, and so I thought, I, well, I need some sort of subject matter, because I didn't want it to be a sort of abstract passing cloud. Yeah. And so I went to Emily Dickinson's house as a sort of homage, and, um, and, and I've 
now become kind of a groupie, and at first they wouldn't let me in, so I, I had to sort of work my way in. <laughs> and now I'm welcome, which is nice, because they have lots of nuts showing up. You're not just and, tapping at the windows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> they just don't answer, they don't answer the phone. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so, and then, so I recreated this, so I measured the light mm. of the sort of sunlight in her garden and then yeah. how that shifted when, the, when a cloud passed yeah. and then used that piece. Uh, so there was a big bank of actually fluorescent daylight uh, lamps that are on a wall and then the big, uh, the big filter cloud hanging in front of it. And so the effect of the passing cloud actually happens as you walk around it. So the yeah. viewer activates the, uh, the effect of the passing cloud in that it, the intensity goes way down and it becomes much uh, bluer and purple, which is what happens in the, um, when, when a cloud passes. I mean, it's like the shadow in a Monet painting. You know, yeah. it's blue and it's purple and it's darker. Yeah, um, and, and that's sort of something of the, I may be wrong about this, but one of the things I think of is also uh, the idea of the flaneur and that, and that sort of description of modernity as the fleeting and the eternal mm. at the same time. And maybe mm. there's something in that, uh, in, in, the, in the passing cloud, perhaps, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but, All the but, world in a blade of grass, eternity in a moment. Exactly. <laughs> um, and speaking of blades of grass, perhaps a perfect conduit into talking about the works that, that are um, perhaps moving into the garden. Mm -hmm. you know, so we've got the, uh, the, the sort of bee's eye view. <laughs> Uh, and there's another work in there, which is you kind of following the bee, and there's, a, there's the poem by Emily Dickinson as well. Right? So do, you, do you want to say a bit about that? I've got the poem here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's... Um, do you want to read Should I read the poem? I mean, yes. it, it wasn't really based on that, but something yeah. that's so in my consciousness that I thought about it afterwards, yeah. and so I think that it, it sort of explains the work in, in, okay. in some way. So. I'll I'll do so my best I'm, on this Because I'm worried, uh, I, even though it's incredibly short, I would recite it wrong. Okay. Um, so, to make a prairie, it takes a clover and one bee, one clover and a bee, and reverie. The reverie alone will do if bees are few. Yeah, um, so beautiful. Yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's lovely. And that, that, you know, the word reverie is, is, has so much to it um, there. Um, but can you, can you just say a bit about what's going on in, in, that, in that piece? And, and uh, you use a GPS system? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah sort of <laughs> a gross, kind of high-tech approach to like, <laughs> trying to, um, to approach Emily Dickinson's sort of perception of things. But um, yeah, so what I did is I, um, I used a GPS to follow a, a bee flying around and then um, took notes when it landed on a flower Mm -hmm. um, and then put a, a sort of mark a flag in, and then it continued. And then as it as it flew, I would mark in, and then and then take notes on the flower. And then I went back and photographed the flower. Yeah. And so then I had this uh, this this route that was um, that was really my route. It wasn't exactly the the bee's route because I was following the bee as closely as I could. I but um, yeah, yeah, but they have a much more sort of uh, beautiful uh, flight pattern than, than I did. So then, uh, for the for the penciled route, I projected the the GPS route mm. and then sort of smoothed out the corners and yeah. and made it feel more like flying and less like you know lumbering after after a beat. And then the uh, colors of the flowers are are done rubbing pastel into the paper and sort of a reference to the. Pollen of the of the bee. Is there something about bees in particular that is interesting? <laughs> I, I, I'm just kind of fascinated by that. I maybe because there there's something so. I mean, I, I'm sure it goes back. You know, Emily Dickinson writes so much about bees. So yeah. I'm sure I'm. You know, I, now I'm like you know, I feel like sort of this like pathetic follower of Emily Dickinson <laughs> and, and illustrator of her, of her, which is something which I'm a little bit afraid of. But um, I, I think, you know, like she can sort of mm. see like something like a bee and it becomes um, so much more. It becomes about, about, about so many, about yeah. whatever creation, about, about the whole world. And I think part of her gift was this ability to focus on something very sort of minor and also very present in, in, her, in her life. I mean, she... She never, I mean, after she was 20, she never really left her town. 
mm. and um, and then never really left her her yard and house. And so um, that I, I find it somehow uh, so compelling that she's able to make this incredible body of work that is um, universal in, in in some way from her observations of of what's just around her. And I, I find that just like a, a a great sort of inspiration for how how one makes work. Yeah. Definitely. And, and is there, you know, there's a sort of interest in, in the garden as a site as well, perhaps. Yeah. Is, that, is that true? Is that something? Yeah, I mean, it's also, I mean, I've also done a bit of work about uh, uh, Giverny, and, um, which I, I find really interesting, not really on a horticultural level, but yeah. more on an optical level. And so really thinking about how Monet designed his garden um, for certain optical effects. I mean, you know, he was sort of interested in plants and things, but he really was interested in painting things. And so he really created this garden and the pond as a sort of laboratory, really, and, and to, to have this play between uh, reflection and transparency in the pond and, and, and the changing color around it. And um, so as a, I mean, of course, his paintings are about, you know, plants, but they're really about seeing, I mean, yeah. especially, you know the water lilies and 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 the and the paintings with the reflection where you can see plants reflected in the water you can also see the depth through the water and you can also see the water lilies on the water i mean it's incredibly complex optics and fascinating yeah. to me yeah 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 uh, yeah that's interesting right wasn't so aware of that sort of almost like setting up a, a studio of outdoor uh, still life or yeah something. yeah totally yeah. you know and he also had that you know he famously had that um, the studio boat that he had in the Seine where he like mm. set up his studio on the boat and would like, uh, you know, go around to different, you know, uh, scenic locations where there was interesting, interesting uh, effects, you know. Brilliant. Um, so one thing that, uh, uh, that I was noticing as I was, as I was kind of um, reminding myself about some of your earlier works is that there are obviously bits that come up again and again. Greek myths. Uh-huh. And you know, uh, uh, it, it is something. Uh, is and obviously Icarus makes total sense, and the, and the sun. Right. Is that also something that is interesting to you, or is it the particular yeah. ones like yeah, yeah. particular yeah. instances of that uh, relating to relating to the sun? Or yeah, I mean, one of the first um, sort of trips I did to actually go and see something because I have this I don't know on some level a sort of compulsion to see things for myself rather than trust whatever photographs, or, um, was to go to the site where Icarus fell into the sea. And right. I did a series of, of work about that. And, um, and I, think, uh, I think that is, I mean, I, I think it's somehow connected to an idea of making a history painting. Okay. And, um, and the idea of history painting and the, re the relation between myth and, and history painting. And, um, you know, I, I'm not, I don't, and I guess it's also about some sort of landscape. And, and the, first, mm -hmm. the first light piece I did that was actually a specific light condition was a, a piece I did in um, the site of ancient Troy. Yeah. And because I, I, I had long wanted to do a picture about that. And it's funny because, yeah, I don't, I mean, I guess like I, I like the idea of history painting in the sense that Warhol was a history painter in some ways. And you know, there, there, where it's not sort of like, say a Delacroix painting of Hannibal crossing the mm. Alps, but something that's sort of, you know, something else at the same time. And, yeah. um, and so I became really interested in doing something at, at the site of ancient Troy. And I, I, like, really, for years, I had, like, really bad, bad ideas. And, uh, and then I finally thought, well, the one thing that hasn't changed since Achilles' time is the light. And so that's how I sort of hit mm. on the idea of trying to make a landscape that was just about the light of a place. So I went uh, there and, because I, I, I mean, it sounds sort of silly, but I, I, I had this desire to see what Achilles saw. And so I went, you know, the one thing that hadn't changed is the light. So I, I, I went and measured the light and then recreated the, that light in a space. So, and yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure the whole, why? I mean, that's sort of a myth, but there's some yeah. history to it. I, I don't know. It's but. interesting. I mean, I was just thinking, as you're talking there about the, uh, almost like the limits of human possibility mm -hmm. and where that becomes poetic or beyond man as well mm -hmm. in, in some other way. Mm. 
perhaps is, is important too. It's also, I think, something that you know, people have a familiarity with, and so, it, so it's, a, it's a way of yeah. sort of having some sort of, uh, you know, have, have a sort of specific content, and so mm. it can be something that, uh, that uh, people, that the, it gives the work a specificity, and at the same time, a sort of uh, openness, and so it's not abstract, but it, it is connected to something and a story yeah. or a place that people are, are, are aware of. And, and so it, it, it sort of locates it somehow without it being too, um, too sort of specific and literal, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, and so I was just thinking about this, uh, this work again, which, we, you know, sitting in front of it, it's, it's really extraordinary. It's so so different from the other works in the show as well. I mean, it's quite, it's quite a bit of, you know, when you, you come in, and I'm obviously in Blackpool, mm -hmm. you know, there's, uh, there's, we have the illuminations. I don't know how familiar people are with Blackpool, but the illuminations, this sort of five mile long lighting display that's been going for a hundred years, and the whole town is very much uh, around questions, I guess, of spectacle um, and, uh, and popular and same popular culture. I, when I see this, I can't help but think of spectacle in, in some way. Uh -huh. But of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a sort of upturning of that as well. Um, you know, and, and also, you know, almost like going into a, a, a room which is an experience in and of itself, but, mm -hmm. but, but done in a very sort of, you know, uh, a subtle, mm. you know, uh, there's a way that that's upturned at the same time. But could you talk a little bit about spectacles? It, it does, it's sort of, um, it, it pops up a bit, but very understated. So there's a kind of, inver there's an inverting of that at the same time. There's a sort of resistance to it, but, but, but Of the you sort know. of spectacle. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it has to do, I mean, I mean, I remember when I was first in New York and, and was, um, and I had a, a, a job in publishing, and it was in Midtown, and I would go, I would go to the uh, Museum of Modern Art for lunchtime. Mm. I had a full hour, and so it, was, it was plenty of time to go. And I was really like thinking about, you know, how, uh, what kind of art to make, what kind of artist to be, and, and I was really, uh, you know, I was sort of trained in a very minimalist um, yeah. uh, vocabulary, and, and a conceptual, <laughs> vocabulary which got, uh, you know, which was um, totally interesting to me intellectually. And then as the, the more I looked, I, I really thought, I, I, I noticed the work that I liked the most had a lot of, you know, at least some visual interest and in that there was work, I mean, for example, something like Ad Reinhardt, which has mm. uh, really always been important to me and it sort of started there. And so I started thinking about the work that, that I, I liked, you know, and, and, tr and tried to sort of dissect it and see what it was. And one of the things that I, that, that I realized was that it work that was about ideas, but also was visually compelling. That yeah. when you, you look at it, you want to, you spend time with it and that you, it reveals itself over time. It's not something that you can get in, in, in one viewing. And so I think that, um, and it's not something I felt comfortable doing because I wasn't, I, I didn't feel confident in making something uh, beautiful or interesting to look at. I felt more confident in making a sort of clever conceptual piece. And so that is something that's sort of ongoing is, is being, is, is an interest in trying to make things that are visually mm. compelling as, as well as have a, a sort of conceptual it's, underpinning. It's, it's fascinating because you really are, as you come in, as you're kind of drawn to this room. And, and that's one of the things I've noticed in, in kind of uh, sort of exhibiting works around light is that we, that we really are drawn to it. We're like moths. We're all <laughs> moths, kind of like, Whoa. but um, yeah, but yeah, no, it's it's it's, it's quite it's quite extraordinary. It's, it's extraordinary, but there is a sort of soft power to it. Um, perhaps it's a good moment to uh, open things up to the up to the floor as well sure. and take some and take some questions from uh, from the audience. Does, does anyone have any any questions for Spencer? <coughs> Yeah, just a quick question about a piece that you haven't mentioned, the, um, uh, the mosaic uh -huh. uh, yeah. piece. Yeah. Um, that, you know, doesn't seem to relate so closely to colour. Could you say something? Yeah, mm. it's, uh, I mean, it's a much earlier piece. It's the, by far the oldest piece in the show, and it's something as I was thinking about the other works, most of which are 
you know, brand new. It, it was something that I, I uh, thought would, had, had connections. And I, I'm interested, especially in this show, with things that don't sort of appear initially connected and then to sort of, I mean, for me, actually, more than, you know, for anyone else to sort of see these, these connections. But it is, so what it is, is it's, it's, it's based on a, on a photograph, which is uh, unusual for me, but only because I was too much of a coward to, like, climb an incredibly tall Himalayan mountain. And it's, um, uh, I, I was thinking about um, this idea of monochromes and these sort of whiteout conditions. And so it, it was uh, being, so it's a, a, a real picture of a, of a whiteout condition. This is on Gasha Brun um, 4. And it's sort of clouds and, and whiteout conditions during a mountain climbing ex ex expedition. <laughs> and um, I, wanted to use mosaic as a way of, I mean, I'm interested in uh, ancient and historical materials. Uh, I've done stuff with uh, encaustic and, and different kinds of and things like cyanotype. I'm interested in learning about different materials. So, the, uh, so I did a series of six, I think six or seven of, of these of different, based on different sort of extreme weather conditions on these, on these high mountains. And, um, and they're almost monochromes, but in fact, there's incre an incredibly large amount of underpainting that ha happened on those. And so there's actually a lot of variation underneath. And so it was a very labor intensive uh, process where I would underpaint, put the tessera on top, look at it, see how it compared, pull the tessera all off, repaint it, put them back on. And then once it matched the photograph, which was almost a total monochrome, because I, I, I only picked photographs or parts of photographs that were, were almost monochromes. Um, uh, then I would uh, glue them on with clear, with the clear adhesive and then, and then grouted the whole thing. So it is, it is a picture of something, it's a, it's, a, it's a monochrome, but it also has this incredible variation of, of the material. And I, I think it also came, I, well, I, I mean, there are also very sort of uh, prosaic reasons for why those works came into being. One was I had just done these series of uh, encaustic poured paintings of, of, Icar of what Icarus saw, and all of them, all eight of them, got damaged in an exhibition because they were so fragile. And it was so upsetting to me. I wanted to make something that was incredibly durable. And so I thought, oh, I can make, but what, you know, mosaics have not lasted over the years. I mean, uh, encaustic <laughs> paintings have not lasted over the years, but mosaics have, and so I, I, um, I worked with that material, and also I think it had to do with this fascination with how mosaic can use this, what appears to be a very crude um, resolution, kind of, to make an incredibly sort of accurate and, and uh, sensitive and, and specific images. Thank you. So that, <laughs> Great. But part of me also doesn't really remember what I was thinking about 20 years ago <laughs> when I started working on it. But it was some of those things. I was intrigued by what you said about Terrell. Um, it seems to me that you um, are drawn towards situations where the generality of color can become condensed into uh, an instantiation, a quiddity, a particularity that is not an illusion. Um, and this has always seemed to me a, a puzzle about colour, that on the one hand, it seems rather general and abstract, it's just colour, in the, it's light. On the other hand, as pigment and as uh, something like a, a mosaic tessera, it's, 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 a, it's an instantiation, it's a specific quiddity of a uh, of something that's very nominal rather than platonic. Um, and this seemed to me to be a characteristic in several of your works, that you have something that could easily be just rather abstract in general, mm -hmm. but you tie it down to a time of the day, a mm -hmm. location, mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and again, bring it back to the materialization of the color or the source of the, of the color in some something, an object which is revealed as it is, like this, you can mm -hmm. see the device. So, <clears throat> bearing in mind that you're also interested in poetry, I noticed, um, and Odin, 
I was thinking, okay, so there's this question about color. Is it an adjective, like it's just a quality of something else, or is it a noun, like it's a thing <laughs> in itself, <laughs> or is it maybe a verb? And if it's a verb, is it transitive or intransitive? <laughs> I think it's a transitive verb. <laughs> no. Um, I mean, I think it's, it, it, in fact, can be all of those things in different situations. And I think the sort of slipperiness and the, uh, and the, and the variability of it is, is part of what makes it so, so compelling. I think it's hard to, uh, to, to certainly pin it down in language. I mean, it's, you know, Wittgenstein wrote that whole book about how difficult it is to, to pin it down in, in, in language. So it's not something that is, uh, that is easy, to, um, easy to name or easy to describe, I think, which is uh, why, why I find it, it's, it's so compelling. Um, and I, I think I, I also feel like it's so... Um, it's so human in some way. There's something about human. You know, and there's that famous line that is uh, sometimes, I, 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 it's sometimes people say Cezanne said it, sometimes people say Paul Clay said it, that the brain, uh, that color is where the brain and the universe meet. And I think that that sort of points to this idea of how there is, it is something that's very, very human and also very much uh, about how we uh, sort of understand the universe. Can I just come in on that as well? Because there was a really nice um, observation that, that was mentioned the, the other day, uh, which was uh, about Goethe and, and, and light, and, and this idea of <coughs> colour coming out of the point where light and dark meet, and that this is almost this kind of place of collision mm -hmm. of which colour emerges, which I thought mm -hmm. was quite an interesting thought. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's just, I was just thinking about that as you were, as you were talking there. Yeah, well, the Greeks like, talked about light and dark, but didn't really talk about color in the way that mm. we, we talk about it. Mm. So it, in mm. some ways, it is, a, 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 I guess, a, a modern thing also. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yes. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the 19th century as a time where you could be an artist and a scientist, oh. and uh, I think we've done a lot in the 20th century to separate the two. Um, and I was just wondering where you think we're going now in that respect. Um, perhaps a narrower question could be, do you see your work contributing to science in a way? To, to science? Um, no, I, what I do see happening, and um, even though I'm, you know, pessimistic about most things, there are, um, I think that there is, there is really an interest in uh, scientists working with artists, which was never the case before. Um, there, uh, you know, I th always artists would, you know, would go to, um, you know, go to work with scientists, you know, since, uh, since uh, Rauschenberg and Warhol and people worked with Billy Cleaver and, um, it, there, there was always this sort of uh, idea that artists could get something from from scientists, and I think, um, in in fact, I think some scientists at least are, are uh, aware that there are other there are other ways of solving problems that are maybe are a little different from the scientific method e even. And uh, a, a friend of mine, actually, the the um, the choreographer William Forsyth, has done a lot of stuff with. Um, with scientists and sort of helping them solve certain problems by his understanding of how the body moves in space. And so there are, um, there are, uh, I think there are opportunities and I think there's also, um, th there's, there's more of a, there's more uh, Places where artists and scientists can sort of get together and work on things, which is which is which is really great. I mean, there's still, I mean, it's still. I, I feel very uh, like I'm on really thin ice when I talk about anything scientific, since I w gave uh, I was giving a lecture once and I um, had done a piece that was sort of loosely based on Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and I started to explain it and 
uh, lo and behold, there was an astrophysicist in the, um, in the audience who uh, it, it corrected me very severely. And so I think that there is, and I think that scientists also feel uh, justifiably sometimes that uh, artists engage in pseudoscience, you know, when, you know, when what they're, they of course feel very strongly about what they're doing. Um, uh, and so when they see someone who's sort of playing uh, fast and loose with their, uh, with their realm, it, it can be a bit problematic. But I think it is, um, I, I, I think that there is this opportunity for, for people to, to collaborate, for artists and scientists to collaborate and, and to understand the world, which is so sort of complex and really cannot be fully explained by science. Even a, a scientist would, would admit to that. And, um, but whether, I, I think the sort of, everything is so sort of specialized, I think the sort of era of, um, you know, someone like uh, the American in inventor Samuel F. B. Morse, who invented the, um, in in invented the telegraph, and, but at the same time was painting a series of paintings about, uh, uh, for all the state capitals of the, of the United States. And so he was doing both simultaneously. I, I think for someone to be able to do that, I, you know, it's just, I think it's too specialized. Spencer, um, you, you, you were talking about no one's been to Mars, but in fact, I've actually been to Mars. Really? Uh, because I'm one of the producers of the film The Martian, <laughs> the, the Matt Damon film. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, uh, so, so Mars is actually in, in, in Jordan, in, in the Wadi Rum, <laughs> where, where, we, where we shot the exterior for, for it, so that um, obviously, you know, we're, we're involved in a whole series of science fiction films, and and science is really science, science fiction, because as, as we're all aware now, science sort of takes over very quickly, and, and what was unimaginable suddenly becomes the, the, the active of the, and, and the imaginable. Um, and and uh, uh, regarding the, the, the sunburst that you've created here, this is actually, to my mind, it, it is, is a pagan icon, because it's, it's really the worship of the sun. It's treating mm. the sun as the god. So was that, in a way, your intention that to to go beyond, you know, back in, beyond creation almost to, to when, when things came, you know, in, in that way and we were influenced by the, the sun and the moon and the stars. Yeah, yeah I think, um, yeah, I was joking we were going to try to get Matt Damon here to tell us exactly, <laughs> <laughs> exactly what it's like. Um, but he somehow wasn't available for this event. Um, <laughs> um, I think it's, you know, I mean, the sun is so, you know, it's, you know, it's this Turner's famous last line where he said uh, the sun is God. And so I think, and, and probably it's, it's always been so sort of important for, for human beings because it is what sort of gives us, gives us, us life. So I think it, it, it probably does go, go back go back to that. And I think there's also this sort of, this idea of a play that this is sort of looks like a, a, a sunrise and you assume it's a sunrise on Earth, but then there's this sort of disconnect when it, there's this sort of awareness that hopefully comes along that's, oh, it's actually a sunrise on, on, on Mars, and how would, that, how would that be different, and how would, that be, how would that be similar? But only Matt can tell us that. <laughs> and Hi. Would you be willing to tell us a little bit about the installation you're doing in uh, Paddington Crossrail yeah, next sure. year? Um, so I'm, I'm doing a, a, a sort of enormous uh, uh, public project for Crossrail for the glass canopy over the, over the entire station. And it's about 180 meters long by about 20 meters wide. So, it's enormous, and it's um, it's based. It's uh, an index of clouds, and so it's uh, it's based on uh, a huge pastel drawing I did of different types of clouds, English clouds, that um, that appear, and uh, it is it will be printed in white, and the background is taken out of the drawing, so it's white on clear. So it's it's basically a uh, a kind of shade, in a way, 
over, over the whole station. And in, on a clear day, you'll look up, uh, like this morning, you would look up and you would see the different clouds very clearly with the blue sky behind it. On an overcast day, the clouds will interact with the clouds, with the real clouds above it. Um, and also it will, um, when the sun is shining through, it provides shade, and the sh but the shade will be uh, projected in the form of, of different clouds, uh, sort of depending on how you move through the station, how the sun moves through the station. So it is, it is a, um, it's on some level, I guess, an homage to the uh, British obsession with weather and also really with the, the sort of history of uh, naming of clouds, um, which goes back to uh, Luke Howard, and it's really 18th century, and, um, and this idea of trying to understand something that is so sort of changeable and beautiful and, and poetic in a, in a scientific way. And so it, go, it does sort of connect with that play between science and, and art, which I, which I find really interesting. And I um, tried to steal as many uh, like constable clouds as I could in, in, one, in, <laughs> in one artwork. So that was the, the sort of history of, of English landscape painting was also really sort of important to me as I, as I worked on it. So it, um, I, actually, I go on um, Tuesday to a factory in uh, Bavaria, where they're doing some pe test panels uh, for it to sort of see, to make sure everything is, is working right before we pr have all the panels printed. So it's been a really kind of <coughs> long, drawn out, but exciting project to work on. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, I think if there's no other questions, maybe that's a good Brilliant. point. Uh, okay, thanks very much, guys. Thank you, uh, Spencer, and thank you, Richard, for the wonderful conversation. Yeah. Um, Thank, thanks for coming out on a day like this. Yeah, it should have been yeah. foggy, right? Yeah. It should have yeah, been yeah, much yeah. more no. foggy today. <laughs> uh, something kind of very out of this world, but also very much of this world. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Richard. Round of applause, please. Thank you.